Welcome back. We're going to be talking about sexuality in infancy and childhood in this segment. Um, so first off, let's all agree on the definitions, right? So infancy is typically the term that we use for babies between birth and two years of age. The word infant literally means no talk. So this is usually the period of time when kids aren't really talking yet. Maybe they're in the one or maybe two word stage. Um, most babies move into the two word stage when they're about two years of age. So um, really the big characteristic that we're looking at is children who are not really verbal yet. So Kinsey provided for us some evidence of sexual behaviors that occur between birth and two years of age. And if you recall, Kinsey had done um, interviews um, that led to his books, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female back in 1948 and 1953, respectively. Um, so he got all of his data through surveys. And um, what he learned through his surveys um, was that infant baby boys have erections, that infant baby girls display vaginal lubrication, that uh, babies, infants, will engage in self-stimulation of the genitals. It's, it appears earlier in little boys than it does in little girls, um, but it is um, it has been observed in very young infants. And there's even some evidence for infant orgasm. So researchers have found that um, the healthier the relationship with the mother, the more likely an infant is to engage in genital play. So it's a lot of times uh, people have thought parents will think, daycare providers will think that uh, an infant who engages in genital play um, is showing some kind of neurosis. I use that word neurosis on purpose because it's a very Freudian thought to act like a child of infant who is touching that part of their body must have some kind of like unconscious problem or um, it's an, it's evidence that the, that something else is going on. Uh, but it turns out it's not, it's actually the opposite. It's a sign that something, something good is going on, that they have a healthy relationship, that they feel secure. Um, so it's actually a good sign. Now you might be con con concerned about how we know about the erections and vaginal lubrication, for example, um, or that there might be evidence of infant orgasm. Like how would we know this? Um, so Kinsey interviewed moms and dads for one thing. Um, he interviewed one woman who said that her infant daughter, um, when when she would be laid down to take a nap or something like that, this, you know, one-year-old little girl on her tummy, because back in the olden days, people put their babies down on their tummies. We don't do that anymore um, because of risk of sudden infant death syndrome. But back in those days, they'd put them to bed on their tummies. And then um, she said her daughter would um, put her hands between her legs and her knees would be bent. So she was sort of like, you know, a little bit her hips were a little elevated off the, off the crib mattress. She'd have her hands between her legs and then she would rock rhythmically. And then she would have like this convulsion and then she'd fall asleep. And her, the mom was really concerned that she was actually like maybe losing consciousness. You know, is she having a seizure or what was going on? Um, so she described it to her pediatrician and the pediatrician said, well, actually, that sounds like she might be having an orgasm. And the mom's like, what, my baby, what are you talking about? Um, and this mom re related this story to Kinsey as part of her survey that, you know, she had witnessed this in her daughter. And a lot of one of the things he, he, he noted was that a lot of moms who were reporting these things about their, their infants were a little bit embarrassed like maybe I shouldn't have noticed that my infant was engaging in something that looked like sexual behavior. Um, maybe there's something wrong with my infant that they're displaying this behavior. Um, so a lot of, a lot of moms had to really be elicited into, you know, it's okay to talk about these things. And you can imagine, you know, in 1950, it probably wasn't considered very, uh, today moms don't really want to talk about these kinds of observations of their infants. And so um, it was, for Kinsey's time, it was quite salacious to be talking about these things. Um, 
Now with the erections and vaginal lubrication, the erections are easier because a, a lot of moms just reported seeing this in their, in their little infant son. So that was, that was easier. Um, vaginal lubrication is a little trickier because it's not necessarily directly observable, right? It's not like it's something you take off a diaper and you just see. Um, and so some of his vaginal lubrication evidence came from doctor's reports. And then this is where some people have really objected to Kinsey. Some of his rep reports on especially the vaginal lubrication came from pedophiles. And so some people want to throw away everything that he discovered about human sexual behavior because he did interview pedophiles for some of these um, details that you can't get other ways. Some people have accused him of being a pedophile. Some people have accused him of hiring their parents to abuse them and then tell him about it and a bunch of other things. Um, reporting on childhood sexual behaviors can be uh, really controversial. Uh, that's for sure. One of the people who accused Kinsey of hiring her father to molest her is Judith Reisman. And um, I just wanted to clarify, he didn't get this information just from parents. Um, now, this college student recollections is not going to be covering the infancy period. Um, the average person, their earliest memory is somewhere between three and four years of age. And so uh, this is not, this stuff I'm talking about with infancy is not going to have been included in most college students' recollections. Um, but more mothers, mothers provide a lot of it. And then, you know, he this questionable data source, right? Pedophiles. And so uh, she, Judith Reisman, has accused Kinsey of hiring her father to molest her and then for the purposes of reporting back to Kinsey. Um, so far, there's been really no evidence to support that. Her father denied it when he was alive and Kinsey denied it when he was alive. And, um, you know, like I said, these um, memories are not usually present that early. And so it's, it's really, um, it's just kind of a, an accusation that hangs out there. We're not really sure what to make of it. Right. Um, the thing that a lot of people really recoil at is that he did interview pedophiles who were not incarcerated. He, in, he interviewed some who were in, in jail, but, um, among those who he interviewed who were not in jail, some people really strongly object to the fact that he didn't report them to authorities. And, you know, back in 1948, 1950, that might have been a, a better complaint than it is in today's times. Because um, one of the things that happens when we do research is that we um, propose our study to the Institutional Review Board. And we have different degrees of, you know, like what kind of research we're doing. If you're doing purely survey research and it's going to be completely anonymous as in you're administering it on, you know, SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics or something online where you can just send people URLs and they can take it from their own home and you never see them. Um, usually that kind of research is considered exempt um, from IRB. They, they look at it. They make sure that the anonymity is there, that there is no way that a person's responses could ever be tied to them. And then, you know, the approval usually goes through easily. But when you're doing any kind of face-to-face -face surveying where the researcher actually sees the participant, even if they don't keep their name or things like that, if they, if they see them and there is the possibility that they could know who they were, um, you have to go to the full IRB committee to look at that and see whether you're going to adequately protect your respondent. And the questions that we're asked as researchers are, is there any probability that your respondent could lose standing in the community, lose their job, be prosecuted for any of the things that they're going to tell you. And if there is a possibility that they could lose standing or they could um, be arrested or something like that, you have to have particular protections in place to make sure that that information were, would never get out. So we, we are required to not report the things that are, are provided to us as part of research. That's different from a clinician's um, role as a mandatory reporter or um, something like that as a, you know, col a college faculty member, you know, I'm a mandatory reporter, things like that. It's different during research and you actually have to, you have to protect your respondents. And so I get what people are saying about, um, 
you know, if you know that this person's a pedophile because of the things they told you, aren't, aren't you duty bound to report them? And it's actually the opposite during research. And think about it. If that person gives me answers, okay, here's a, just a fundamental problem with surveys at all. The person gives you answers that may or may not be true. We talked about this back at the very beginning of class when we talked about research methods in human sexuality. When you conduct a, a survey, the respondents answer your questions and there's no real way for you to confirm or deny whether what they said is true. And so imagine if they say things to you, they could be bragging about something that never happened and they think that they're being cool by telling you this story. Um, imagine if you reported people and then let you know the police investigate everybody who gave you what might have turned out to be a, a bragging or they were just trying to mislead you because that's the kind of person they are and whatever, they, they have something else wrong with them that that's not pedophilia. Um, imagine if you reported people and based on self-reports. Um, we also are not allowed to suborn them into doing stuff that they that's illegal. We're not allowed to do that to people. So this would be just in the cases of self-reports we are prohibited for, from revealing what they've said so to, to authorities. So I don't mean to defend Kinsey on that, but I mean, I, it's just, it's a, it's a faulty argument given how, how we're constrained as researchers, right? We're not allowed to do what people say that he should have done. So, all right, moving on. Let's get the, these children a little bit older. Three years to puberty. Wow, that's a pretty wide span. Three years to puberty is a pretty wide span. Um, it shows you sort of um, that, you know, the research on this area is pretty um, vague, right? Three years to puberty. All I can say is that across that time, they start to show more and more interest in sexual behaviors. Not necessarily that they are, you know, wanting to engage in them, but they're curious what it is. Um, you might see children uh, um, during this period experiencing what we call puppy love, um, right? Where they're having little crushes or they, um, when my daughter was in elementary school, her little um, group, they had this um, ceremony that could be performed in recess, recess where um, two classmates could get married by sliding down the slide one after the other. <laughs> Okay, that's interesting. I had never heard of that. I, maybe it's a new thing and all the young kids around the country are doing it, but um, I had never heard of, you know, sliding down the slide and now you're married. Okay. Um, you know, and each marriage lasted sometimes as short as up until the next research. <laughs> I mean, the next recess. And sometimes it was, you know, a couple of days before they had the um, marriage annulled. I don't know. But they were, you know, displaying behaviors that were um, evidence that they knew that like marriage means something you know, um, being cute means something or, or another, you know, they're starting to have these little increases in sexual interest across this time period. Um, masturbation starts to become um, different than it had been in infancy. In the, and for one thing, um, you know, there's less of just sort of touching your own genitals in front of people, right? It's something that they start to learn is um, inappropriate to do outside their bedrooms. Um, parents tell them that, things like that, that their peers will tease them if they touch their genitals in, 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 you know, at recess or something like that. Now within that though, we are going to see from now until forever that males masturbate more often than females do. It's about twice as common among male children as it is among female children. Um, when female children do masturbate, they tend to do it in private, whereas male uh, children oftentimes will report that they do it in a group or in pairs. And oftentimes there's like this um, competition component to it um, where they're racing. And uh, so just sort of just another, um, ex you know, example of like um, differences in how males and females view things on average. Um, now, between the ages of three years and puberty, there's uh, an increase in the rate of what we call sex play. I just really want to emphasize the word play because this is not um, goal oriented, orgasmic behavior between two partners. This is two children engaging in exploratory behaviors that are sort of um, preambles to what it, after puberty will become, you know, more goal oriented, more, you know, sexually based. Um, sex play displays a lot of curiosity, 
you know, that's that would be the one thing that you could say really characterizes sex play as something different from what happens after puberty. There's a lot of curiosity. They want to know what kind of genitals other people have. They want to know what's under those clothes, things like that. So here I ha I'm going to take a little break and let you um, queue up into the playlist. This dad having videotaped his little boy, he calls it his first girlfriend. So you guys can check on that and I'll see you back on the other side. 